What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always Headphones Neil with a slightly different episode than usual in the form of I'm actually going to make this a two-part episode so uh, or a two-part set of episodes where if you notice on the YouTube channel I haven't really been uploading my gameplays for Assassin's Creed Origins this week uh, mostly just because I haven't had much time to actually play the game but also because it's related to a TV show that I've been watching where I've finally been able to catch up on Picard season three now that all the episodes are out. So I wanted to see why I keep hearing why the season was one of the best seasons of the show so far and kind of see what, what all the hubbub is about. Um, I was relatively unspoiled as to what is going on or what happened in the season. So um, going into it, I was, like I said, unspoiled, but in retrospect, retrospect, there were a lot of indications of kind of what was going on, what could happen, and what um, uh, generally did happen. So this episode is going to cover um, Picard Season 3, along with my review of uh, Linux distribution. So for next week, the plan is, because of what happened in Picard Season 3, it's going to be a follow-up for that, so I'll jump into that once I finish the review. And then um, there will be the review for Star Wars Visions Season 2, so that released on May 4th. I haven't had a chance to watch any of those episodes yet, but if they're anything like the first season, there will be a couple of episodes that um, I will like because they're geared towards my style of what I enjoyed about those episodes. And then a few that are kind of more lighthearted, silly, and... Not something that I would generally go for, but they're very generally well done. Um, I don't have an Android app review for this week, but for next week I am planning to do a follow-up as far as this week's Linux distribution, but having or using an Android launcher that is kind of equally as customizable as um, picking a Linux distribution. So to start it off... Um, like I said, I uh, focused this week because I didn't have a chance to play much video games. I was really tired with work for after a few long days. So I caught up on Picard Season 3. I generally did an episode a night starting last week. I think one night I did a couple of, ex or one or two nights I did a couple of episodes just so I could get through all of them. And overall, I am actually really impressed with the season because this actually feels like it could have been a second season, um, not necessarily a first season, but um, it actually tied together um, a key story arc from the um, from the next generation in the form of the Borg, and it also introduced um, Picard's second or Picard's son Jack, and tied out why Wesley was not in the original or why Wesley Crusher is not in this. Um, season. So overall the uh, initial burn of the show is reintroducing the um, original crew of the USS Enterprise from the last generation. So you have uh, Picard teaming up with Riker. Um, then you have the introduction of, and then you have a little bit of uh, Deanna Troy. You have the distress call from Beverly Crusher. So that there's that tie-in early on as well. And then you bring in Worf. So his Whole th or he was one of the two best things about the season for me. So I did a post on Twitter and all the social medias that I don't know was better. Stoic War from the last generation or from the next generation TV series or Pacifist War from this se uh, season where um, in general uh, Michael Dorn um, does a really really good job of Playing the character, um, it was very enjoyable. I liked him on screen every time he was on screen. Um, his interactions with Rafi were great um, as far as battle and the Klingon way of life. His interactions were with, uh, with Riker were also on par. I had direct correlations with their interactions from back during the Next Generation days. So all in all, a good thing there. Um, the introduction of Jordy was really good with his daughters. So... You know, you have Jordy being the way he is, and then his two daughters being very, very different, where one is very much like him as far as the engineer side, the other one's the pilot side. So um, that was very well done. But the other thing that I really liked about the season is the um, friendship and general bromance that is reunited, restarted 
once you have uh, Data back in the picture and then the interactions between him and Jordy were top notch. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad that we could, um, that we had that introduction. I liked the acting by um, Data and I'm, now I'm drawing a blank on the actor's name. Um, but I like the switching that he did with and how they dealt with the whole multiple personalities in one body and the barriers and then having, you know, Data, Lore, um, Soong. I think there was one other personality. Oh, a B4 in there. So dealing with all of that was very, very well portrayed. Um, so I like, I generally just liked all of that on the character level. And then once you're, or while you're watching the show and you see that, um, um, discussion or with um, Jack having his visions and being able to impress his mind upon um, other people by and then by the time you get to the end of the um, or they do drop a, uh, a little bit of tidbit as far as what's coming in in the second half of the season where they talk about the um, the fleet the star fleet fleet being ships being able to talk to each other communicate with each other as one so between that and Jack's vision and being able to push his t thoughts into other people, is that kind of trigger that, how, is this going to be something related to the Borg? This is very Borgish um, as far as what's going on. Um, and like, who's the, who are the changelings talking to? Like, what's going on with all of that? So by the time the Borg are introduced, you're like, that's it. That light bulb goes off that that's exactly what was going on. And the explanation that the cybernetic or um, implants that were given to John Luc Picard as Locutus um, were actually, and because the the Borg are you know a mix of cybernetics and organisms or organic um, stuff, you know that that is very possible that um, stuff was left behind to have better integrate you know um, electronics and computer parts with the human body. So. Um, I guess Locutus or Picard um, was one of those things where he was the most compatible human to start this uh, process or one of those few that could start this process. So that's why he was only the transmitter of the voice or like trans or sorry, the receiver of the instructions. So by having an offspring in the form of Jack is what allowed that two way communication to be set up. So all of that was very well done. So. In the first half of the episode, it's set up, it's introducing all the cast. The second half is dealing with all of that. Um, so once you get into the second half of the episode, it's um, I'm kind of also glad that they tied out introducing the museum that um, Jordy was working at and then um, holding back the showing off of the Enterprise D that was from the next generation. Um, until the pivotal scene, a moment in the se season where they actually needed a ship. So all of that balance was very well done. So um, I, I, all I can say is that it was one of the best seasons of the show. So it actually shows how okay, like, it's not to say that the first two seasons were bad, but um, I guess though they had reached their peak. So this actually helps set up all of that, round out the Borg threat once and for all, I hope. Because thinking about it now in retrospect, First Contact should have solved it. Everything in the TV shows, I think, should have solved it if memory serves. And I think it's also resolved in um, Star Trek Voyager, I think. But um, it's one of those things where they should take care of that. Especially since now that they made 709 uh, captain of the Enterprise, um, Jack um, Crusher is basically number one and all of that so it's actually very it was a very good transition of moving from the um well, i guess the episode title is good a movie from the last generation to the next generation so i'm actually curious to see if they're going to have a new star trek season um just based on this to, or focused around the enterprise having cast that we're familiar with you obviously can't have the net call it the next generation but one of those things where um they bring a new series uh, based around the Enterprise. You have these characters you know. You have, you know, um, whether or not Data's there, but you know, you have Seven of Nine, you have Jack, you have Jordy's daughter, I forgot her name, but I kind of now want to show it all of, with all of these characters, have both of Jordy's daughters on the ship 
So you have one as a pilot, one as the engineer. So I would actually be interested in seeing a show exactly based around that current cast and crew. Um, just to see what they could do as far as the new adventures of the Starship Enterprise. Um, so with that being said, that's all there is for the review. I recommend watching it if you the, or watching the season if you are a fan of um, Star Trek, The Next Generation, The Enterprise, or anything like that. Um, you don't necessarily need to watch the first two seasons to know what's going on. Um, I think the main character that you would not know much about is Rafi, but it might actually fill in a little bit more of our backstory to watch it, but you can generally um, watch um, season three as its own um, season and show. I like it as a limited run show if you've watched The Next Generation and you know who all the characters are. So with that being said, um, as a bit of a teaser for next week's episode or an announcement for the next week's episode, uh, watching season three made me want to go back and rewatch all the prior episodes from the next generation um, that are related to the Borg. And it's uh, basically it's another like seven or eight episodes in, in total from what I could see online. So I actually now want to go back and watch those episodes um, just back to back, um, push them out, see how they handle the Borg at that time. Just the next generation, not necessarily anything related to Voyager. I was hoping that First Contact would also be streaming on Paramount Plus where I was watching Picard, but I didn't see it, but I'm going to still look again just in case. So if it, I do see it streaming there, then I'll watch it. Um, but the plan is to watch all the Next Generation episodes related to the Borg to see how they all tie together and just go do a refresher and review on that. So with that being said, um, for the non-TV show movie review for this week, I actually wanted to share a bit of thoughts on, let's say you have an old computer, laptop, or desktop, doesn't matter. It doesn't necessarily have to be on its final legs, but I got to thinking that um, with all the hubbub around Windows 11 that you need to have, um, I forget what it's called in your BIOS, that you have to have it in all, installed in order to use Windows 11. Uh, for me personally, that part is kind of okay, fine, whatever, but I actually don't like the icons grouped in the taskbar. It's kind of weird to have multiple windows open. Um, so I got to thinking that I would share my thoughts on how to pick a Linux distribution to say that, let's say you're moving away from a Windows machine. Um, you don't necessarily want to buy a new one. You don't like all the pre-installed stuff that they include. Maybe it's not in your budget to buy an Apple product which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it's the same thing that let's say you have an old Mac computer, um, whether it's a laptop or desktop, and you wanna repurpose it because you don't really feel like you need to spend more money for a new computer, it's not in your budget. Uh, maybe you spend most of your time watching you know, videos, communicating, um, browsing the websites for shopping or social media and things like that. So picking a Linux distribution can be a pain because there's a lot of distribu different distributions. Some are based on Debian or Arch or Ubuntu, um, and then all those different base layers of Linux have different versions on them. So, you know, there's KDE Plasma, there's something called Cinnamon or XFCE. So how do you pick an environment that works best for you? So for me, the best balance of um, features and visuals and simplicity is any distribution that uses KDE Plasma because for me I like the visuals of a Windows style desktop and makes it um, easier for me to use. Um, the alternative is a Mac style layout um, so a desktop environment like Ubuntu works well. Um, you can use a distribution like um, uh, Nitrux, or I think it's Nitrous or Nitrux, something like that, which puts that dock at the bottom and various things at the top. Um, and there's a lot of different flavors of things you can get to do that. Um, a distribution like Zorin OS gives you, lets you, or has a good base level. I think it's based on Ubuntu. And it lets you pick between a Mac style layout and a Windows uh, desktop layout. But um, for me, what, it's one of those things where... Um, I want something that's kind of regularly updated, it still feels modern and refreshed, has a nice quick boot time and all of that. So that's where the distribution called KDE Neon comes into play. So it gives you a stable base, so there's things called 
a long-term support version of Ubuntu, and then there's also a rolling release that are that's more regular that's more regularly updated, but um, is not going to be supported for as long. So they're generally supported, I think, six to nine months, whereas a long-term support distribution is um, uh, supported for a number of years. So KDE Neon, Neon is based on a the stable version of Ubuntu, I think 22.04, which was released in the past few years, but continuously updates the front end, so the KDE Plasma desktop, uh, various apps um, that are installed and things like that are KDE related. So not only do you get a stable uh, platform or a base, but you get a more modern visual style that's regularly updated with bug fixes and performance updates and features and things like that. So if you are a Windows user on a computer that's, you know, let's say four or five years or up to four or five years old, I think the laptop I'm using at the moment is maybe seven or eight years old at the moment. So it's not necessarily the latest graphics or latest video card. It has a dual core processor, I think at two or 2.6 gigahertz. It has, I think four or six gigabytes of RAM. So not, you know, the highest specs, but when you I'm booting it up, it still take it only takes like 20, 15 to 20 seconds. Performance is really smooth as if um, I just bought it today. So it's one of those things where um, using KDE Neon gives you a lightweight user interface and performs very, very smoothly. So the th I'm go I am going to miss things like not being able to watch, you know, 4K videos, but I can stream YouTube and various streaming services at, you know, 1080p, so that works out nicely. I can generally multitask, so I can have, you know, a few tabs open. Um, I can still manage videos on YouTube. I can um, have, you know, spreadsheets going while watching a video or uh, listening to music and things like that. Um, so one of those things to consider for me as a recommendation is if your laptop does feel like it's getting old, you don't want to, you know, buy a new version of Windows, you might not want to spend a couple hundred dollars or whatever I don't I don't know what it is for just buying Windows 11 but for me um it's one of those things where I have a laptop it's working perfectly I just swapped out the hard drive for a SSD about a couple of years ago so it's one of those things where you can essentially install Linux to do the same things with on a Windows desktop that you do now but you will miss a few things here and there so I will give you the caveats so um, when you install it, you do get, you know, an office suite in the form of LibreOffice that you can install from there, the Discover Store. Um, you can still install things like Dropbox to sync your files. You can use, you can still install um, Google Chrome as a web browser. Um, you may not get all browsers available like Brave or DuckDuckGo, but because you can install like, you know, Chromium or Chrome, then you do have, you still get a modern web browser. Um, Firefox does come pre-installed, so it's not like you're left out in the dust to figure out which web browser to install. You do have the, a well-known browser pre-installed already. Um, if you want something for direct file transfers, then there is an app called KDE Connect, which allows you to share files to and from your laptop to your mobile device. I'm currently sharing between my laptop and an and, and Android phone, so you can easily do things like you know, buy music from Amazon and transfer it wirelessly to your uh, mobile phone. Um, and then there will be things like, for example, historically, um, uh, programs like TurboTax have not generally worked well. I haven't had a chance to try this year's version to see if it's any better, but you could always try things out with programs like Wine to add the Windows compatibility layer to install programs. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, in general, you may find if it's popular enough, you may be able to install apps. So uh, those apps. So you can also do things like run um, Steam natively, and then if you turn on the Proton um, layer, then it gives you that compatibility layer for some games that might be Windows only. Um, so you can tr um, install. I'm gonna generally do a blanket statement of you should be able to install most games. Um, on your Linux machine because Proton will emulate some of the back-end stuff that it needs to run those window, Windows games. Um, so you can, and you'll, by doing that, you get general improved um, gameplay performance because Linux is generally lighter weight than Windows, so there's more available resources. Uh, you may not be able to play all newer games, um, so for things like 
Um, most recently, Star Wars Jedi Survivor was released. Um, so that's one of those things that I do want to buy it to try it out to see how well it runs. But you may or may not be able to run, um, you know, the latest games on the highest um, video settings. But um, if the, you are able to um, run games at a, a lower setting or in a performance mode that is easier on your laptop, they may run. But if you have, um, but if there are games available on Steam, like more retro games like Doom or Doom 2, um, and maybe some even newer games. So I think a while ago I tested, you know, Max Payne and Max Payne 2, which just seem to run okay. Um, as long as you don't have, you know, certain launchers that act as a middle way to launch the game. So games like Rogue Squadron 3D have a little bit of trouble running, um, and then things, games like Knights of the Old Republic, you do have to go in and edit some files so it doesn't run in full screen mode. So it's kind of hit or miss when you get when it comes into gaming on Linux, which is sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So it all depends on what you want to play. But if you're doing just general things like listening to music, looking at pictures or Facebook, watching YouTube or Netflix, then they just work because you have a, you're able to install, uh, use Firefox or Chrome to do what you need. So for me, I recommend KDE Neon because it's regularly updated um, based on a stable core. Um, if you want one that's not necessarily as updated but still give you that win that gives you that Windows look and feel, then you can try Kubuntu. That's K-U-B-U-N-T-U. Um, it is also based on Ubuntu, but it's just another flavor. So rather than giving you that um, Mac layout and look and feel like Ubuntu, Kubuntu gives you that Windows look and feel. It's very similar to KDE Neon, but it's not as regularly updated. They kind of update um, in general based on more stable releases and updates. So you may not be on the latest version of KDE Plasma, the window manager, but you will be, you know, a couple of um, versions behind. So you're not too far behind, but you can still get some of those regular features. Um, and then Linux, or, and both of those do offer or allow you to install custom themes, which for me, I will make the recommendation not to install global themes, but do the individual sections. So install the window decorations, um, icon pack, and cursors individually instead of the global themes, because they're kind of hit or miss as far as how well they work. But if you install the individual components, for me, this seems like they work a little bit better and are more stable that way so that way you can also mix and match things so if you prefer the window decorations of you know windows xp but you like the mac os um, cursor pack and then you like the windows 11 icons then you can mix and match them a little bit better to suit and make the you know your desktop look however you want it to look so that's all there is for that. So I'll have a link in the show notes to KDE Neon so you can kind of check it out, see the system specifications, see if it's see if your laptop or desktop still work. But for me, um, if it's not in your budget to buy a new computer or you don't really feel like buying one right this second, then I recommend looking up you know Linux distributions to see one that fits you the best. But for me, KDE Neon is that good balance of everything just like Kubuntu. Um, if you want to be able to switch between different layouts to see which one works best for you, then I recommend Zorin OS. Um, they offer, I think there's a basic version that is more compatible with older, like much older desktops, but there's a, I think it's called Zorin Core that gives you a couple of different layouts. Um, it's in that middle ground between um, including a lot of software, a lot of themes, and but also requiring a slightly newer machine, you know, within the past 10 years or so. Um, Zorin Pro is also good. They all do offer um, a num a lot of themes or, or themes. They unlock basically a pro version unlocks all the themes for when you buy out buy the key. Uh, it comes pre-installed with a lot of different software. But essentially, they offer these different versions based on um, if you want to spend money or not. Um, I think as of a few months ago, it was like thirty nine dollars or something like that. Don't quote me on that as it might have changed. But essentially for $39, you get an OS that has all these different things and in, uh, software installed, different themes, and kind of gives you that best of all worlds in Linux where you can do things like install Chrome and Dropbox and Steam. It gives you a free different theme so you can try out a Mac, uh, low, uh, Mac OS layout. Um, if you want a Windows um, XP look or a Windows 10 look, it'll let you pick between those different um, looks and feels. 
and decide which one you like and just go with it. And since you already have the um, system installed, you don't have to do anything else um, beyond that. So um, I guess my subs or my secondary review will be um, uh, Zorin OS. Um, but if you just want a basic what layout, just go with something easy to install. KDE Neon is a way to go. Um, you can install it on your traditional um, hard drive or a um, SSD if you have one of those. I recommend an SSD just because you get the uh, faster boot time, good performance, and all of that different stuff. Um, but overall, KDE Neon um, gives, is a little bit more on the technical side, and but is also best suited to um, transition from a Windows OS to Linux, whereas Zorin OS kind of takes a little bit more of that Apple approach. With, and same thing with Kubuntu a little bit, but more on the Zorin OS side where they take that that Apple approach where they'll say, okay, we're going to give you the front end, we're going to lock down some of that technical stuff so you don't have to worry about it because ultimately how many people are going to go into or how many people want to go into, you know, drivers and DLLs and how do you install a software if you, I just want to download and install it, be done, or go to a store and install stuff, you know? So Zorin OS works best for that. KDE is good for the Windows side for that transition, so... I recommend either one of them. Both of them are good. I prefer KDE Neon just because um, it lets me pick the theme I want. So if I want to go with a Mac theme today and then Windows 10 tomorrow and then a Chrome theme or a Chrome OS theme the day after that, it's easy to switch on that front. So with that being said, that is all for this particular review. So next week's episode as a follow-up to this week's episode is going to be um, a little bit more on Android launchers. I kind of wanted to go a little bit more into Nova Launcher, which I think I brought up uh, last week when I talked about Custom Live Wallpaper Maker and when comparing it to launchers like Pro Launcher and O Launcher. So um, with the talk of Linux this week, next week's review will be the Android Launcher, Nova Launcher. So that is all for this particular review. So if you have any questions, comment, feedback, or anything like that, you can um, comment on the posts on various social media sites, all of which are linked on the website at headphonesneal.reviews. Um, that also has all the various subscription links, way to support the show, and all of that good stuff. But if you want an ad-free version of the show, if you want access to it earlier than when it's available on the public feed, you can uh, support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash pateln01. And of course, the video version of the show is available on YouTube at youtube.com slash pateln01. But thanks for tuning into this particular episode, and until next time.